All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Steve Asterno, the Director of Treatment Foster Care at the ARC Northern Chesapeake Region. Uh, and this is our second episode of our TFC podcast. And we are lucky uh, today to have two guests with us, um, both, both from SARC. Uh, we have Allison Imhoff uh, and Becky Chandler. Uh, so thank you both for, for joining us today. Uh, do you want to tell just a little bit about sort of your role and maybe how how long you've been with SARC? Sure, I'll go first. I'm Allison. I am the Director of Counseling and Client Services. Um, I've been at SARC for about four and a half years now. Prior to my current position, I was the Director of the Safe House. Um, okay. And so I oversee clinical um, client services, our human trafficking program trainings, and our hospital companions. Okay, sounds like a lot <laughs> that you oversee. That's great. Uh, Becky, how about you? So I'm Becky Chandler. I am the community educator for SARC, um, and I started at the beginning of the year. Um, so my role is to develop and deliver uh, presentations at different organizations and partners and agencies. Um, social groups in the local area, and um, just kind of educating people on different topics, um, different issues that we work with the SARC and making sure people know who we are and what we do and that we're there for them when they need us. That's great, thank you. So I, I know there's some community members that are aware of what SARC does, uh, but for those who may not be aware, can, can you give sort of a, a brief overview on sort of the major services you provide and, and who, who you provide them to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so SARC is S-A-R-C. Uh, we stand for the Sexual Assault and Spousal Abuse Resource Centre of Harford County. Um, and it was established in 1978 um, after there was an incident of sexual violence in the community. So the residents at the time realised that there was a lack of services, that there wasn't enough support. Um, so they really banded together to put those in place. Um, so still we work with individuals who've experienced or are experiencing childhood sexual abuse, um, domestic violence or intimate partner violence or teen dating violence, um, stalking, um, sexual violence or assault in any way, um, amongst other things, we're also working a lot more with human trafficking victims. Um, and I really love that SARC was created for the community, by the community, and it continues to operate in this way um, because we use and rely on our local partners so much. Okay, great. Um, you know, I'm, I was wondering, and when you when you had sort of shared what SARC is, I want to make it clear for folks who may be listening that SARC is not related to our agency, the ARC. Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> good that, point. <laughs> you, people may find, you know, may uh, ask that question, but yes, no, no, no relation. Uh, although maybe we collaborate, there's no relation between the two. Uh, Allison, I I do want to ask you how. How do you guys get referrals? If if someone is needing some of the services you provide, how do you find out about them? Sure. So uh, the best way to get information about us is uh, we have a website, which is www.sarc-maryland, spelled out, .org. Um, however, the referrals are often self-referred um, because we want the survivor to be their own advocate. We have a 24-7, 365 helpline um, that we have trauma-informed um, staff that are manning it or womaning it, whatever you wanna call it. Um, yeah. so literally all day, every day, no matter if it's two o'clock in the afternoon, two o'clock in the morning, um, if it's you know Thanksgiving night or Easter morning, you're going to be able to get someone who is therapeutic, trauma-informed, and can get you resources right away. Um, during business days, um, people are able to receive counseling services, legal services, things like that. Um, but we have our phone helpline. We also have a text chat. Um, so if it's not safe for you to call, you're welcome. To, we have our hours. We always post them on our social media. Um, but we do accept um, referrals from other agencies as well. Um, it's not uncommon for us to get a call from a concerned mom because their teenager might be in an unhealthy relationship. Um, we really can't start services until that person 
who is the identified survivor actually reaches out because they've already lost so much control over what's happened to them. We want to make sure that they feel empowered to reach out to us, but we never um, frown upon someone coming with them. Um, you know, right now we're under construction, but we're actually opening up our administrative offices again here in the next couple of uh, weeks. Okay. And it is not uncommon to have a friend come with someone and just do a walk-in. Um, and then while we're kind of going through a crisis screening or providing resources, the friend just waits in the lobby. Um, so really self-referral, friends, family, concerned neighbors, uh, coworkers, other, other um, agencies around are all welcome to send referrals. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't realize when you were talking about having that texting option. I, that's, that's great. I, I wouldn't even think about that as a, as a possibility. Uh, but that, that, that's, a, that's a good service. Sometimes um, it's not safe to talk um, yeah. on the phone. Um, so during, uh, in the uh, early 2020, we realized that text might be one of the safer options. And we've kept it going ever since. Yeah, that's great. Okay. I know um, very much like our program, confidentiality is really important. Um, how, how, do you, how do you navigate that, you know, the issue of confident, confidentiality versus, um, you know, just providing the services that an individual or, or family may need? Sure. So everyone's heard of HIPAA, right? You always have your medical records protected under HIPAA. Well, um, Domestic violence and sexual assault agencies also um, honor something called VAWA, which is, I always describe it as HIPAA on steroids. Okay. Um, <laughs> so unless we have a release from the survivor, we cannot confirm nor deny anyone has ever been a client with us. Okay. Um, and that also, you know, goes with um, people who, we do would normally have to disclose that information. Now we obviously honor, you know, the courts and you know things like that. And if one of our survivors has, you know, some legal things that they need to take care of, we cannot protect them from that. Um, however, um, our abusers that we've worked with come from every different socio socioeconomic status and career. Um, and so we have to treat every survivor like their abuser um, could get into our, um, our system okay. or could track them down with the GPS. Um, so not just physically, our, um, our agency is unusually protected. Um, but our staff is trained to um, not disclose any information unless the survivor has given us permission. And even then it's only good for a period of time. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, that's probably one of the, the most important parts, right, of the work is, is forming that trust with the clients and, and making sure that nothing's disclosed that, the, that they don't want uh, to be shared. Okay. And so th this next question is really for the both of you. Maybe Becky, I'll start with you. Um, what do you feel are, are the biggest challenges that, that SARC is facing right now? Oh, goodness. Um, I'm going to have to defer to Alison on that one. Um, I work part time, so I'm not kind of as, as involved with the day-to-day the -day runnings and things like that. I think there's definitely been some um, changes in policies and legislations, which have had a huge impact on services like ours um, and, and the support people might perceive, um, not just from services like ours, but from, from those around them, um, which might push people towards us more. Um, and I'm just really grateful that, that we exist and that we are so trauma-informed and, and client-centered. Um, but Alison, definitely a better place to answer this one. <laughs> Thank you, though. Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of start on the individual level and move up in regards to our challenges. So a lot of the times when someone learns that another person is in a, 
abusive relationship, their response is, well, why don't they just leave? And what most people don't realize is that it's not normally just physical. There's emotional, there's financial abuse. Um, And then there's generational cycles that tie into it and expectations of families. No one is really out there saying like, I'm getting beat. They keep it under wraps. So most of the time, by the time people find out, it's been going on for a long time. And it has affected them, not just physically, but mentally, emotionally. Um, Abusers don't normally just start with hitting. It's a testing of boundaries. It's a isolation. Um, There's literally a cycle of violence that people will go through multiple times. Mm -hmm. And research says that it'll take seven attempts to leave an abusive relationship before they actually do. So we can't, we never force any of our survivors to get protective orders or um, to not maintain contact with their abusers. Now we do go through extensive safety measures and confidentiality. And we have a lot of conversations about, are you ready? And right. if you're not, it's okay, but we need to make sure that you're safe. Yeah. Um, a lot of the times people think that when survivors do finally start talking about what has gone on, um, they think they're exaggerating. Um, and so what support system they had hoped to have really actually isn't as safe as they had uh, thought it would be. Okay. Um, I would say almost every single one of our, um, clients have experienced financial abuse. And that's something that a lot of people don't talk about, whether it's credit sabotage or rental history sabotage or refusing to let them work, um, or, There's the expectation that, um, especially for our female survivors, that they should just stay having babies all the time. And for, um, you know, any of our families, especially when you're now a single parent and you're not really getting financial assistance from anybody and you have multiple kids that are under school age, Um, trying to schedule to actually get your feet on the ground to get a job, to get daycare, to get transportation is incredibly daunting. Um, So those are some of the biggest challenges on the individual level. Um, And then on the, the bigger cultural level, a lot of times, especially when you're talking about sexual assault or human trafficking, it's so taboo. Um, and Becky can speak to this because she's out in the community so much. Um, but when you want people to buy into this is an issue. Um, when I, t- I've, I've grown up in Hartford County, I'm, you know, multi-generations. And when I tell people that SARC services 2,000 survivors a year, their immediate response is, you've got to be talking about somewhere else. No, we're not. Um, And to get people to actually buy into what we do, um, we have to make sure that people are not, you know, bombed with trauma. Um, You know, we have to remind them that like this is happening um, and not to victim blame. So Becky, I went, no, you wanted to chime in. <laughs> yeah, no, that was exactly, that was exactly leading I was hoping for. It was, um, yeah, just, just being able to kind of get into places to speak on these issues. You know, people don't like to acknowledge these things are happening. Um, it's scary to believe that we live in a world where sometimes these things happen and we ha- have no control, you know. That's why victim blaming happens. We like to say, oh, well, if they've made different choices, I wouldn't make those choices. Um, so I'd be safe and and that's not the case um you know so people don't want to acknowledge don't want to talk about it um and I understand that but it's it's really important to, because it is happening um and it might be happening to someone you love and 
you might be the person that they confide in. So, you know, my role is really to make sure that people, you know, we don't need to go into all the gory details, that's absolutely fine, but at least they know where the support is so that they can they can give that number to the person at the time where they need it. So yeah, definitely just just starting that conversation can be can be challenging sometimes. Yeah, I mean, there's so many different layers to this, right? I mean, we see it on our side, on the foster care side, is that we see biological parents who have been victims of abuse or, or continue to be victims of abuse. And so their care for a variety of reasons comes into the foster care system. Um, and then we have to obviously make sure that the child's well-being is okay, but we're obligated to work with the with the families too and and trying to get those kids back with the families. And so if there are issues of domestic violence, um, trying to sort that out is certainly no no easy task, but it's like you said, uh, Allison, like 2,000 survivors. I, that that's a big number to me. I didn't I didn't realize it was it was that high. Yeah. Um, so I started my career working as a foster care worker, and um, to this day, to see the the generational trauma that occurs and it's it's what foster care is doing you guys are trying to break cycles of of trauma of norms of environmental stressors of mental health issues um and that's really what we're doing too yeah um unfortunately it's not uncommon for us to have survivors who grew up in the foster care system right. or um when we're working with human trafficking survivors um unfortunately foster care kids who are in foster care are an easy target sure. um so really just kind of understanding how did we get here um you know it didn't just start with this one individual normally there's something that has occurred in their lifetime or multiple things that have occurred in their lifetime that we kind of have to unwrap. Um, and it's very, very similar to the work done in foster care as well. Yeah, yeah, there's certainly a lot of overlap. Um, so I, I know we talked about the challenges. Let me sort of flip, flip it a little bit and talk about, to the extent that you can, some success stories uh, that you've had um, you know, over the years or, you know, things that just sort of stand out to you guys? Sure. So um, I'm going to reflect back a little bit onto my time working in the safe house. Um, and some of our most successful clients over the years are people who came to us at the right time in their life and came to us completely vulnerable, we're trusting complete strangers um, to keep them safe from the, the people who were supposed to be the safest people for them and weren't. Um, we've had, we service uh, women, men, and children. Um, and we take great pride in servicing people how they identify. Um, but a large number of the households that we have serviced are young moms who have a lot of kids. Um, and honestly, there's so many families that we've serviced that have four, five, six kids. And the, the parents would come to us and say, how can I possibly work? How can I possibly support myself? Right. I have never even had a lease by myself before. I've never paid my own bills. I was always told that I wasn't smart enough to do it. And I believed them. Um, so it's those families that had every barrier up against them. Um, it's, those, it's those survivors who have, um, who finally got answers when they realized they weren't dumb. But after years of abuse, they had a traumatic brain injury um, and really kind of working through with them what kind of life skills they needed to build up. We've had people who had so little life skills and so little confidence, they couldn't do their laundry by themselves. They didn't know how to make a meal for their kids because they believed that they were, they were dumb. They were, they were not valuable. 
Um, so really kind of seeing the success of those, of those households, not just be able to do those things, but be able to live independently without us. Um, and we always love when they call and just say, hey, I'm okay. Um, but I was thinking about you guys and, you know, they always know that we're here if they ever need us again um, for any reason. Um, but the ones who have left saying, I now see what was going on that whole time. And I'm going to do my hardest to make sure that it never happens to me or to my kids again. So that's any number of our success stories, but um, those are my absolute favorite. Yeah, it, it really is. I mean, just hearing you talk, you sort of have to rebuild the person, right? It, it's not just the practical things like, how am I going to pay my bills or am I going to be able to work or like daycare for kids? It really is trying to empower the person to believe in themselves so that they, then they can do those practical things. Very much so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Becky, did you have uh, success that you wanted to share? Just, um, I wouldn't say like, I, I really enjoy my work. I enjoy, you know, giving kind of information to people on lots of different topics. As I mentioned, you know, I also do like healthy relationships, boundaries, consent, like all different kind of ages, whoever wants it. And whenever anybody, you know, really takes something from that, that's really wonderful for me. But I think that I'm also in the lucky position that when I am out in the community or I'm at these events, people will stop and say, you know, I used SARC in the past and it was really, really helpful. And I'm so glad you guys are there they you know from my understanding of these conversations with people um it really kind of marked a turning point for them it was the start of a very positive change um, they look back on the time favorably um you know rather than it kind of being really a dark time they see it as this the opposite really it was this it was the beginning of, of a new part for them and I've, i was as i said i've only been here for kind of this year really and to be able to kind of benefit from all of these this wonderful work that people have been doing before it's really yeah, it's special. Yeah, no, that's great. And I'm sure there, there are people out in the community who maybe after listening to, to our discussion or maybe they've been thinking for a while that they want to try to help in some way. Are, are there certain things, if there's a, just a community member who's you know wanting to help in, in some way, not sure, not sure how to do that or, or where to do that, what, what would you say to them or what would be like, you know, the first couple of steps if, if they wanted to, to, to help Sark out in some way? So number one, we couldn't do this work without our community members supporting us. Um, you know, we're not a huge agency and, um, you know, between our volunteers who come and organize the pantry or the remarkable agencies that literally adopt every single one of our families that need to be adopted for Christmas or back to school or things like that. Um, we do have opportunities for, um, you know, either in-person or virtual support. We have volunteers who occasionally cover and our helplines. We've had volunteers actually do um, hospital companion in the past, which is when people go to the hospitals after a domestic violence situation or a sexual assault, and they need to stay for, um, we call it um, a safe exam, but it's a rape kit. Um, and sometimes you just need someone there to support you. Um, or if someone's experienced severe domestic violence and needs to um, get some medical attention. Um, so we do offer volunteer opportunities like that. Um, we also have several events throughout the year. I'm, you know, anyone who's been around Harper County has heard about our Walk a Mile in Her Shoes, yes. um, which happens every spring. And it's literally community members, uh, local government officials, politicians, business owners, neighbors, friends, survivors who will literally walk all around Main Street in typically women's high heel shoes yes. to raise awareness. Yeah. Um, we also have a bull and oyster roast, uh, typically each March. Um, and then we also have a, a balloon glow gala, which occurs typically in the fall. So we are always welcoming anybody who is interested in kind of coming to one of those events, learning more about what we do. And honestly, 
because we are not a large agency, that those uh, funding goes directly to our survivors. Um, and then, you know, we are we have been working to finish a capital campaign here over the last couple of years um, that is changing our safe house from a 28 bed safe house to a 40 bed safe house. Oh wow! And cool. allowing each family to actually have their own space. Um, prior to this, it was very much like dorm living. Right. Um, so we have worked really, really hard to make it a more therapeutic environment for our survivors and um, for generations to come. So anybody is welcome. Again, you can check out our website www.spark-maryland.org. Um, and there's even a whole separate link to like how to get involved too. Yeah, that's great. I mean, for for a small organization, you you guys really provide a a vast array of of services, um, which yeah. is, obviously is needed, right? Yeah, and I'm really excited. One thing that people get excited about as well when I tell them about the kind of um, you know the changes that are happening with the safe house and the expansion is that it's going to include a pet shelter for dogs and cats. That's been such a huge obstacle for people not wanting to leave their situation. Yeah. Um, why would you want to leave? You know this adorable creature um, who may have been a huge source of support for you with an right. abuser so that's really exciting um, and then we have you know free legal services free counseling free case management everything that we offer is completely free we're kind of a wrap around um, we do also offer an abuser intervention program and that's the only thing that we kind of ask for for money towards on a sliding scale so we just try and be as accessible as possible for whenever people need us um, and that's it's one of the most incredible ways to help is to just raise awareness make sure that you're you know making victims aware of our services when and as they need it so even just talking about us telling people what you've heard is a right. huge huge part of, of promoting um sark and, and helping us and survivors yeah that, that's great I, I love the the idea of having you know their their pets being able to to be with them it's something that you know can be easily overlooked when when there's you know domestic violence happening. But um, but like for most of us, pets are part of the family, um, and they provide unconditional love. You know, no matter what's going on. So it's exactly. super important to 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 have them. So yeah, that's a great idea. Especially after working in the safe house, I can't tell you. I've lost count of how many people have said who were in a highly lethal situation, but they said, "I can't leave my pet." Wow. Um, so it's just really, it's really cool that our, our team, our board, our CEO all said, well, then looks like the animals are coming too. So. Yeah. No, that's great. I love that. <laughs> I love that. Um, so the, the last question, and this is for both of you and maybe Allison, I'll start with you. What, I, this is hard work, right? There's, there's no way around that. And, and it's emotionally, I'm sure taxing and I'm sure it's hard to, you know, to, to leave it at the door. Um, what, what keeps you in the work? What, what keeps you going? So, um, I'm the mom of two elementary school kids and I always joke that like no one at career day says I'm going to be a trauma clinician. Um, you kind of get into this field by destiny and default at the same time. Okay. Um, you know, every single one of our staff landed here with different plans and honestly what keeps me coming back is there are days where you feel like you are seeing the worst of the world um but all you need to do is literally show up to work and you see some of the most incredible humans you will ever meet um no matter what we do our team keeps showing up and <laughs> I just good. always find it to be like <laughs> so remarkable. Um, like these are like solid people. And I always kind of say like, we're just humans trying to help other humans. Right. But like the humans on the SARC team, our volunteers, our board members, they are a different breed. Um, they have seen some stuff. Um, and they have mastered the skill of helping someone without letting their emotions get the best of them 
-hmm. after that client or their survivors taken care of, they take a break. Um, but they keep coming back. Um, <laughs> and I've just always said, as long as they keep showing up, I'll keep showing up. So um, that's what keeps me uh, coming back. Yeah, that's great, Alison. Uh, how, how about you, Becky? So, I mean, I find I find this work extremely interesting. Um, you know, I, I really enjoy sharing what I know with other people. Um, so I do a lot of research and I enjoy kind of passing that on. Um, my background's in like mental and behavioral health. Um, so I really see that link between education and therapy. Um, I hope that by educating people, they don't need the therapy in the future, you know, that we're kind of filling in that gap before they get to that point and they can spot those warning signs. Um, before there's trauma involved I'm not trying to put any smart colleagues out of a job but I think every single one of us dreams of a time where our communities are safer and we don't need to offer our services to anybody anymore um, and I think you know inch by inch that's why that's why we do it and that's where we're getting to I yeah think that's, so, that's great yeah go ahead. so we recently um we recently have been under construction and we were given the opportunity to kind of write a message um on our new building and to kind of resonate with becky our goal is to not be needed anymore yeah. um and we'll all make do if that day ever comes <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, but right even <laughs> our mission even our mission says to end this need yeah um so i think we all are in the same boat no, definitely. I mean, for for us and for my team, it's the same thing, right? We we don't want foster care to exist, um, and so we try, you know, the best that we can to to get the kids out of the system as as quickly as possible. So yeah, there's very much, uh, uh, well, there's a lot of overlap between what our missions are and and what we're trying to do. So, um, well, I I appreciate both of your times today and, and your willingness to share and all of your expertise. I, I think for people who will be listening to this, um, it, it'll be really insightful. I learned a couple of things today, which I didn't know. So I thank you for that. <laughs> um, and I hope uh, some people are able to, to reach out to you to, to volunteer or, or to donate or, or you know do something to, to help Sark. Um, so mm -hmm. thanks very much for, for your time today.